actually want to correct one thing you said. Actually, uh, with my department head responsibilities, every every one of our department heads in the College of Ag does have a small extension appointment. Oh, I didn't know that. So I actually can have a license to come out and do this kind of work yet, and I appreciate that. So. Um, Seems like my calendar gets pretty full with a lot of other stuff nowadays, but but I enjoy the opportunity to come out and, and do these sort of things and, and visit with folks. So, what uh, Carl and and uh, the organizing committee asked me to visit with you about this morning is talk a little bit more about some of the other co-products that we have in the state, their nutrition values and and that sort of thing. I I did want to follow up just a little bit on on Dick's question that he had relative to conception rate. Most of the questions that, that come from high protein diets and conception rates, Dick, are in the literature with the dairy industry, uh, particularly with, with dairy heifers. There, and there is data that does say that once you get up to 22, 23% uh, crude protein levels in the diet, that you do run into some conception rate issues. Uh, and basically what happens, at least in the dairy literature, is that those high protein levels, because of the way the protein is metabolized, no longer used as a protein source or an amino acid, but actually used as an energy source, it ends up uh, creating excess levels of urea in the bloodstream, and that actually, the urea actually has some negative effects in the uterus relative to the attachment of the embryo in the uterus. So uh, you'd have to supplement an awful lot of distillers and most of our typical forage diets for beef cows or beef heifers before we'd approach those kind of levels of crude protein in the diet. But there is some indication that you can have problems. And so if you're on a high quality forage and you were trying to supplement some additional distillers, that's probably where you might see the problem if it was going to develop. But uh, in most cases in the beef industry, I think it's fairly low likelihood that you'd ever have those kind of issues develop. So what I'm going to talk about today, uh, this morning for the next half hour or so, is a little bit on, on what makes a co-product or a byproduct a, a byproduct. Why is it that way? Uh, we'll talk about some of the more common byproducts that are available, uh, things like wheat mids, potato waste, uh, sugar beet pulp, and, and associated byproducts, and then just a little bit on some of the oilseed meals. So that's a, a brief outline of what we're going to cover. So why is it a byproduct? And I think to understand the nutritive value of these sort of processing co-products and stuff that's out there, you really got to take a little bit of time and step back and understand what the, the, the processing company or the processor is trying to get out of those products. And so with the ethanol industry, what, what an ethanol producer like Thorlton that you toured this morning is interested in is taking that starch that's in corn and turning it into ethanol. Uh, and so if you understand what the processor is trying to get out of their product or taking out of their stream, you can understand a little bit better what some of the characteristics of the products that you're dealing with as a byproduct might be like. So are they interested in the starch? Are they interested in getting the oil out in the case of oilseed meals? Are they interested in some other fraction? Uh, the remaining product that you end up with is usually marketed as livestock feed. The other thing you have to understand is what's being added back. Are there other physical or chemical processes that that product is undergoing? Uh, what's being added back into that stream? Uh, in the case of the distiller's grains, then understanding that, that sulfur is used in that process or added to uh, the uh, fermentation vats to control the pH so you know that there's going to be some extra sulfur in those byproducts aside from what the corn originally had in it. So I think if you understand that process and understand a little bit about the physical processes, the chemical processes that, that uh, those products undergo, you'll, you'll have a little better appreciation for, for what some of the nutrient profiles that you, you might expect to see actually be in there. So if we just take an example of, of uh, let's just use the, the frozen potato industry. So if you are working with a potato processor in, in Grand Forks or Jamestown or Park Rapids, and, and they're producing some kind of frozen potato products. Could be French fries or hash browns or whatever. Uh, in that process, the, the physical process that, that, that they use to do that is, is a process called steam peeling, where they actually use steam to, to help remove the peel from that potato. Uh, the processor is gonna cull some of those potatoes that come into that plant because of size. 
because of quality assurance concerns, they, maybe they've got uh, some sort of quality defect that they're going to throw them out for. Uh, and they're also going to add back, in most cases, products that are rejected. Once the product goes through uh, the slicer to make potato products like french fries, they've got machinery and so on in place to, to look for quality control relative to fry length, uh, blemishes on the fries, etc. And those products typically end up in, in the byproduct stream as well. So if you understand what the processor is doing and the processes that they're using to get to their food product or, or industrial product, you'll understand a little bit better what might end up in your byproduct stream. So let's talk a little bit about some of these specific products. So wheat mids is probably one of the more common ones, aside from the ethanol co-products in the state of North Dakota. And wheat middlings is basically a, a co-product that results from uh, the processing of either flour or durum, uh, wheat, spring wheat into flour or durum into semolina. And what you typically have in, in those products is uh, wheat bran, uh, the germ, and some of the residual starch, depending on how they're milling it, that, that remains there. Uh, those products are available year-round. In some of these cases, that we're going to talk about some of these byproducts are available only seasonally. Wheat mids are available throughout the year. They're usually pretty competitively priced. Uh, the majority of those products are shipped out of state. So uh, this is a dry byproduct, about 85 to 88% dry matter, about 12 to 15% moisture. So they're, they're pretty easily shipped in rail cars or trucks to, to out-state locations. Typically, this byproduct is pelleted, but you will run into a couple of plants, and Grand Forks is one example to St. Mill and Elevator, where, where you can get them loose, or what they call bulk. Uh, they're usually pelleted because you increase the density enough where it makes them more competitive, cost-effective to ship. And so the, the bulk product that you get that wouldn't be pelleted Typically, you can't get an uh, entire semi-load or a, a 40,000-pound load on a semi because you're, you're dealing with too much volume. So generally, you, if you're going to transport them any distance, you really want to look at uh, the pelleted-type product. Uh, typical protein would be 18 to 19 percent. Average out of our laboratory, uh, when I was doing a lot of extension programming in this area, was about 18.7 percent for protein. Energy-wise, if you want to talk it on a TDN basis, typically it's going to be right around 80%, which is less than corn and less than barley. So they're a less energy-dense feed. They're, they're a little more fibrous. Uh, very palatable. They work well in a variety of, of different types of feeding situations. Uh, generally speaking, you're going to see them used probably a little bit more in terms of, of use in forage-based diets than you would in a feedlot diet. There's a number of processors in the state that you can get these from, and this is just a list of, of names and phone numbers. If you, if you want to call about availability, that's where you'd go. Because of some of the seasonal price swings that occur, generally speaking, the price for this product is going to be lower during the, the summer than it is any other time of year. That's when, when demand for these is generally the lowest. Consequently, the price is typically the lowest during the summer. And so if you can lay them in uh, in the summertime, uh, that's generally going to be a little bit more cost effective. However, because of some of the moisture issues that you have with them, you're going to have a product that's about 85% dry matter, about 15% moisture. You're best off either storing these uh, in flat storage, like a commodity shed, or in some type of aerated bin where you can get a little uh, air under them and draw that moisture level down just a bit to get them to store long term. Otherwise, you're going to end up with some mold development uh, with, with these products. So in, in feedlot diets, uh, my experience has been uh, as, as uh, working with producers that, that are feeding these, in, in backgrounding and growing calf diets, they, they work very well as a complement to your, your grain sources. So barley, corn, uh, those sort of things, wheat mids make a nice complement to those in, in a backgrounding situation. Uh, you can feed them, you know, up to your gain goals. Typically, I would say the limit would be no more than 10 pounds per head per day. Uh, my experience with them is once you get up in that uh, seven, eight, nine pound range, you tend to start to decrease or, or get poor feed conversions uh, with those because of the fibrous nature of those products. Uh, you can self-feed them, and so you can use them in creep feeders. 
uh, creep feeding diets for calves on pasture, also self feeders for, for background and calves. Uh, feed conversion efficiency isn't great when you, when you do it that way, but it does make it a pretty simple way to feed them. In the finishing diets, again, they're probably going to be used mainly as a protein and fiber source, uh, replace some part of the roughage in the feedlot diet. I would generally recommend no more than about 15 to 20 percent on the top end in a, in a finishing diet just because the more you feed, the poorer your feed conversion efficiency is going to be. And so there's probably an upper limit in that 15 to 20 percent range for, for that unless, you know, you can get them bought very cost effectively. So let's talk a little bit about the potato processing co-products. So uh, these products are going to come primarily from uh, frozen potato product manufacturing plants. So plants that are going to be cutting french fries, uh, hash browns, tater tots, those sort of things. Uh, almost all of this product in, in those plants is going to be a steam peeling process that's used to, to take the peel off of those potatoes. Uh, so generally, your, your product stream is going to vary a little bit depending on what type of product they're making, but essentially you're going to have the, the peel, uh, the discarded potatoes, uh, any of the uh, product that gets rejected off the line, so uh, short fries, fries with blemishes in them, all those sort of things typically end up in this byproduct stream. It's been my experience that, that uh, depending on the plant you go to, there, there's a little bit of difference in the moisture level of the product that you actually end up with. And so with the product out of Grand Forks, uh, there's plenty of people here in the audience that got a lot more experience feeding that than I ever uh, will have in my lifetime. But uh, generally speaking, that product is high in moisture. Uh, our, our analysis of that plant's products over the years has been in that 85 to 87 percent moisture range. The plant out of Jamestown uses a little different process to, to get some of the moisture out. Uh, they have some centrifuging equipment that removes some of that moisture. Their product is, is down in that uh, 70 to 75 percent moisture range. Uh, but again, all of it is going to be very wet product. And the, the challenge with any of the wet byproducts, particularly with products that are this wet, is with diesel fuel hovering around four bucks a gallon, transportation long distances becomes an issue. Uh, the product typically is going to, like I said, going to contain things like the peel, uh, some of the, the residual starch, reject fries, small potatoes, that sort of thing that you're going to have with that. Our general recommendation, if you look at most of the data that's out there with some of the work that we've done, that Carrington's done, uh, somewhere in a finishing diet, probably 15% of the diet or so is probably the upper limit in terms of, of uh, before you start to really impact feed, per, uh, feed efficiency and, and performance. Uh, and most of this product is going to be stored either um, on a slab or in some kind of bunker. Uh, generally speaking, either an earthen bunker or a, a concrete bunker, but we'll get into the storage uh, issues a little bit more this afternoon. On the sugar beet byproducts, uh, those products uh, in this part of the world are going to be available through American Crystal Sugar, uh, their five plants in the valley here, plus the Mindac plant uh, at Wapaton. Uh, most of that product is, is brokered by a company called Midwest Agra, who's based out of California but they handle all the brokering for, for the molasses, for the sugar beet byproducts that, that come out of these plants. They also handle, because of, of Crystal's relationship now with Sydney Sugars at Sydney, Montana, uh, brokerage on, on that product out of Sydney as well. Uh, the beet pulp is a nice product to feed because it's a highly digestible fiber source. Uh, it, it's a product that's not going to cause you any acidosis issues uh, because it lacks the starch. Uh, it's low in protein relative to some of these other byproducts, only about 9% crude protein, so it's not going to be a, a product that you're going to buy as used as a protein supplement. Uh, in our experience and in, in working with producers that are using quite a bit of this product, it, it works pretty nicely in backgrounding rations as a replacement for corn silage or about in that kind of energy um, kind of ballpark that you'd have with, with this type of byproduct. And you can replace some of the roughage in a forage, in a, in a finishing diet, uh, with the sugar beet pulp. And so you, you can use it kind of depending on the, the type of diet you're feeding, either as an energy source or, uh, into more of a replacement for the roughage in, in, your, in some of your finishing diets. 
generally speaking, you, you can get this product either as a dry pellet or uh, as wet shreds. This is some research that we did with the, the product uh, back in the late 90s. Uh, two, two graphs here, the, the one on your left would be uh, diets where we went from 0, 20, 40% of the diet in, in background and calves uh, without the addition of concentrated separator byproduct. And the, the graph on your right would be diets where we added 10% uh, of the diet as concentrated separator byproduct, which is basically the desugared molasses that American Crystal produces. And you can see that, that as you increase levels here, uh, that average daily gain decreases in these growing diets. And the reason is because of that bulky nature of that product, uh, it's highly fibrous. It's going to make the cattle feel a little bit fuller, and they don't eat as much. And so when you go to these kind of levels, Dry matter intake typically drops. Uh, feed conversion efficiency gets a little bit poor, but they kind of fill up on it, and, and it's pretty bulky. But you can maintain, I would say, acceptable level of, of performance up to 20% of the diet dry matter is beet pulp. You know, going to 40% here is probably questionable unless you can get it bought really cost competitively. And again, that was with the wet shreds. So like I said, that you can get it as dry pellets or wet shreds. The, the wet product is typically 70 to 75 percent water, in some cases a little bit wetter than that, uh, depending on how their uh, machinery is operating at the plant to get some of the water squeezed out of this. Um, again, because of the, the moisture content of it, you really got to look carefully at transportation costs. But I do know this winter these plants were moving loads of this product uh, all the way out from the Red River Valley into the Mandan Bismarck area. So they, they were taking it quite a ways, even at $4 diesel fuel. Uh, we've got experience storing this, the wet shreds in silage bags. So getting it in late in the season, the end of the processing campaign, typically April, May, uh, we, we would get this product in and put it in ag bags, plastic silage bags, and store it through the summer. For some of our research, it worked pretty well. But you're probably going to end up with a cost of, of uh, five to six bucks a ton with that storage uh, in the in the egg bags, and so you got to consider that uh, into the equation as well. The pellet product uh, stores really well in flat storage, commodity shed type storage. Uh, pretty easy to store it that way. So I want to comment just a little bit on sugar beet tailings because that's another byproduct that's coming out of these sugar beet processing plants. So this is a product where the, the plant is, is basically kind of screening the beets as they come in. Uh, the small beets, the dirt, all the other junk that comes in uh, on the truck is going to get rejected and put in the tailings. Uh, so moisture content, extremely variable here, but, but we've seen samples come through our laboratory of uh, upwards of 85% moisture. So again, if you're looking at transportation costs, uh, you're looking at a pretty expensive bill if you start moving this kind of product very far. High in dirt, high in soil, uh, those sort of things essentially are diluting the energy value and the nutrient content of the product that you're getting. Good tailings, ones that, that don't have a lot of dirt contamination in them, uh, probably are comparable to corn silage in terms of feeding value. Uh, Products that got a lot of dirt in them, loads that are pretty trashy, uh, you're going to simply dilute that energy content, and, and you're essentially filling those cattle up with with um, soil instead of something that's got some nutrition to it. One comment I'd make is kind of watch out for occasionally you're going to see uh, cases of hardware disease because of wire or other metal objects that come in out of a field, end up in the tailings product. Uh, it's just something to kind of watch out for. The other thing that occasionally happens is cattle want to try to swallow these smaller beets, and so occasionally you're in tailings you're going to get beets that are anywhere from an inch to two or three inches in diameter. Uh, they want to try to swallow those whole, and when they do that, you get a choke issue with them. So it's just something to kind of be aware of uh, if you're dealing with that, that type of byproduct. Okay, whole sugar beets is another one that, that uh, occasionally comes up either in the fall uh, when when uh, these cooperatives are kind of deciding how many beets they're going to harvest that they've had, like the last couple of years, uh, record crops, you always have the discussion that they're having, uh, you know, are we going to harvest all the beets that are out there? Are we going to disc them down? Uh, we've had worked with people in the past uh, throughout the years that have 
taken in whole beets either in the fall or got whole beets out of storage piles where they started to go bad and, and crystals went in and tried to clean out some of the hot spots in their storage piles. Uh, those products uh, typically have a higher energy value than beet pulp do because the, the beet itself is going to contain about uh, 18 to 20 percent sugar plus the associated pulp and, and water. And so when, you, when you're getting the, the whole sugar beet, you're getting that sugar in there as well, which is an energy source for those rumen microbes. And so uh, we've worked with people that, that are, are feeding those to cattle. Similar in protein to beet pulp, so about 9% food protein or so. Our best recommendation is to chop them prior to feeding, but I've seen people just take them out there and dump them on fields and, and let cattle kind of go in and graze these whole sugar beets. Uh, you end up with some choke problems with, with that as well. Uh, and they can be in soil, so, so if you're looking at long-term storage here on something like this, uh, you can chop them in, in like a hay buster and then mix them with, with some other dry byproducts or grains and pack them into a silage pile. And because of the sugar content, they'll ferment very nicely and make a pretty nice silage uh, with those whole sugar beets. But again, every step of that process, between transportation and, and grinding and then packing into a pile, you're adding cost. You're associating more cost with the fuel and so on to do that. But, but there are ways to store those. I want to talk just a little bit about the wet corn milling process. Galen mentioned this a little bit, but uh, I'll talk a little bit about the process that Wapaton uses to produce um, high fructose corn syrup. And essentially in wet milling, what they're after, again, is the corn starch, but in this case, Typically, they're using it for food grade production. In the case of, of cargo corn milling at Wapaton, they're producing high fructose corn syrup or, in some cases, starch. But uh, the, the starch that they're using is either going to go on the industrial side to produce some kind of corn polymer or produce ethanol. But corn gluten feed is one of the byproducts that, that occurs or results from uh, this wet, what they call wet corn milling. And it's made up of a byproduct called corn steep liquor, which is the steep water that the corn was soaked in prior to milling. And the corn bran or the outer covering, the fibrous covering of the, the corn kernel. What typically happens in these wet milling plants is that corn is soaked in, in sulfurous acid for anywhere from 48 to 96 hours. And then it's milled. So whole corn soaked in this mixture of water and, and acid. And then you run it through a mill. It peels the uh, corn fiber off of the hull. Uh, that goes into the byproduct stream. They extract the starch. And then the soap water, the steep liquor that the corn soaked in, contains some of the soluble nutrients that came out of the corn kernel, plus the, the sulfur that they added to help the process. And that ends up getting put back on the corn bran. And so you have this product called corn gluten feed. Corn gluten meal is a high protein meal that comes out of the, the corn protein, the, the zane protein that's contained in the corn kernel. That ends up in, in pet food and poultry applications. And the uh, corn germ meal is the corn germ, so it's that part of the seed coat that, that uh, would contain the sprout if it was sprouted. That ends up getting typically added back to the corn gluten feed. Uh, sometimes it's sold separately as a separate byproduct. So one bushel of corn going through one of these wet mills, like at Wapaton, is going to produce about 31 and a half pounds of corn starch, about 13 and a half pounds of dried corn gluten feed, or roughly 34 pounds of wet gluten feed, a couple of pounds of corn gluten meal, and about 1.6 pounds of corn oil. So that's the byproduct yield. What is cattle feeders are really interested in this, this corn gluten feed, and that's the byproduct that's going to come out of a plant like Wapaton. Generally speaking, it's going to be sold wet, about 60% moisture coming out of the Wapaton plant, or if it's dried and pelleted, it's typically going to be 12 to 15% moisture. Uh, 21, 22% protein would be typical for this byproduct. Uh, energy content varies a little bit depending on if it's wet or dried, but the, the wet product typically would be equal to corn in terms of energy, roughly 88% TDN in that ballpark. The dry product, because of the drying process, uh, does create or, or changes the, the chemical profile of some of the fiber in that product. It 
typically, you know, 83% PDN on the dry, so maybe a little bit more like barley would be in terms of feeding compared to corn. Pretty palatable product, and it's available out of uh, Cargill Corn Milling in Wapaton. One of the things that happens with this particular byproduct um, is that the, the dry pellets, when you get them in storage, can bridge, and it can become a problem. Uh, so typically, best results for storage in, in the, the corn gluten feed would be to get it into some kind of uh, flat commodity storage structure, um, commodity bays, that sort of thing. Uh, 25 to 30 percent of the ration on a dry matter basis would be kind of the upper limit of what you want to feed to, to maintain equal performance of corn. And if you're going to have a lot of it in the ration and move it very far, you, you probably want to look at the transportation cost of the wet versus dry. Um, let's just briefly talk about some of these other co-products. So the, the barley malt sprouts and barley malt pellets would be a product that you'd get either out of uh, Bush Agri Resources over in Moorhead or uh, Lattice Ag over in Spiritwood. Uh, basically, what they're doing in those plants is taking those barley kernels and sprouting them, producing the malt, and then the product that remains is going to be the barley hull, uh, the malt sprouts, uh, screenings, and, and thin barley that gets put back into that, that byproduct. Lower energy, typically about 74% TDN, so something in the, in the neighborhood of what you'd consider kind of oats type of uh, energy content, about 14.5% crude protein. Um, a very palatable feed, a very safe feed to feed because of the fiber content. Uh, this is one feed where you're, you're not going to be able to get cattle to overeat or get into acidosis issues with these uh, pellets. Uh, and again, Laddish and Spiritwood would be the major supplier, also uh, Bush Agri Resources over here in Moorhead. The liquid goat products that are out there, uh, at least here in the valley, would be uh, molasses from the sugar beet industry. Uh, most of these liquids are going to be used primarily for a couple of purposes. One would be to control dust in the dry ration uh, or to improve palatability or to add some other specific nutrient. But most of the, the plants here in the valley are no longer producing what we've traditionally thought of as molasses. Most of them are now producing this product called desugared molasses, or uh, in some circles you hear it referred to as concentrated separator byproduct. But essentially, they're taking what was molasses, removing about half of the residual sugar, and you're left with a product that's lower in energy, but uh, higher in protein and higher in some of the minerals than what molasses was. Condensed distiller solubles, Galen mentioned earlier, is a byproduct of ethanol production. And corn steep liquor is a liquid byproduct that's occasionally marketed out of plants like in Wapaton from the wet corn milling industry. Uh, those products generally, like I said, are going to be used as some sort of ration conditioner, some sort of, of dust control agent in rations. We've covered that already. Briefly on the oilseed meals, uh, there's a number of plants throughout the state that are processing uh, things like canola, sunflowers, soybeans, those type of products, they're, they're after the oil. They're going to typically go through a mechanical process to squeeze some of the oil out, and then they're going to use hexane to solvent extract the remaining oil that's in the meal. And so typically with these products, you can end up with a... Uh, Residual meal, it's going to be relatively high in protein, uh, low in fat or oil, and generally speaking, you're going to have oil content down around 1 to 2%. Um, and most of those products are going to be uh, used in, in any kind of cow rations or, or feedlot rations as a protein supplement. With, with all of the ethanol byproducts that are available in the state now, uh, you're, I my impression is you're seeing less demand for some of these kind of products because you're getting plenty of protein from other components of the ration. But we'll, we'll cover a few of them, more of the major ones, just briefly. Sunflower meal, 38-39% uh, crude protein, relatively low energy content because of the, the sunflower hull is relatively indigestible. So the more hull they're putting back into this meal, the lower the energy content is going to be. Uh, ADM and Enderlin and Cargill and West Fargo would be your two 
main suppliers in this area. Canola meal, 35% uh, plus crude protein typically, uh, higher in energy than the sunflower meal is uh, because the, the hull of canola is a little bit more digestible. Sources here are going to be uh, the Altona plant in Manitoba, uh, ADM in, in Enerlin and Belva, and then Northwood Mills in, in Northwood is also producing this product. And then Halleck, Minnesota has a biodiesel facility under construction there that's going to use canola. That'll be another major source of canola meal that, that'll come online here in the next uh, year or so. Safflower meal is a, a minor product uh, produced from a plant out in Culbertson, Montana. This side of the state typically don't see much of that product here, but it's about 25% crude protein. Soybean meal would, would be what we'd consider kind of the gold standard for oilseed meals. Uh, and the reason is because it's relatively low in fiber and its protein quality is excellent. And so for swine and poultry diets, soybean meal is really what they, they want to have. Uh, primarily because it's, it's got very good energy, very digestible, and they're looking for specific amino acids in those diets, where in, in cattle rations, because of the rumen uh, function and because the rumen is, is the microbial population is producing uh, amino acids for the, the cow or the steer to use, we're not as concerned about protein quality. So soybean meal is one that, that uh, really gets almost exclusive use in the, the Swine and poultry industry, very little use in, in most beef cattle diets. Soybean hulls is the other byproduct, though, from, from soybean oil manufacture that, that uh, we've got an opportunity to use in beef cattle diets. And so this product would typically be about 80% PDN, uh, about 12% crude protein. Works pretty nicely in, in backgrounding diets, in, as a component of a creep feed those sort of applications where you're looking for kind of a higher fiber but a highly digestible fiber uh, type of, of supplement that might be used for beef cows in the winter as a way to stretch some forage or as a component of a backgrounding ration. The last one I'm going to cover is, is uh, edible bean splits and so this would be things coming out of these bean plants from any, anything like kidneys, black turtles, uh, all of those types of edible beans that, that you typically see going into human diets. Uh, the splits from those can be fed to cattle. Uh, you've got to watch. There, there's compounds in these edible beans called enzyme inhibitors, and generally what happens is they interfere with digestion at the small intestine level, and once you get about uh, 7 to 10 percent of that product in the diet, you're going to start to see the cattle get very loose, uh, get some cases of scouring, and so my Best recommendation is if you're going to use these, keep it to 5% or less of the diet or go through the hassle of actually roasting them and heating them to the point where you inactivate those enzyme inhibitors. But from a cost effectiveness standpoint, I think you're better off simply just doing the 5% level and, and kind of watching the stool consistency and seeing how they're doing on them. But that is one product that, that is available um, out of Inglevale if you're looking for byproducts. So. Karina, I don't know what you want to do scheduling-wise, or do you want to take some questions now, or you want me to hold those? Everybody's hungry, so they want to get the meal. Uh, J.W. Schroeder, who's the extension dairy specialist, and um, every so often they put together an updated pricing list and availability of, of products um, from North Dakota, and I think there are a few Minnesota, South Dakota plants on there, as well as some contact information. Um, he puts this one out. Carl Hoppy also puts out a list. Um, a very similar information. Um, so if you have any questions about that, you can either visit um, with JW or with Carl here. He will be here all day today. Are there, has anybody thought of a question for Dr. Lardy this morning? Yes, Tim. Um, what is the 
Well, just wondering why um, you've got the feeding amount limited to 15% or less. Oh, I. Yeah, and the, the recommendation we have on that, Tim, is based on not only our research, but uh, some of the research that was done in Idaho and Washington. And typically, what, what we saw in our research is once we got above that, 50, and it's 15% on a dry matter basis, so you got to kind of take that into account with the, with the moisture content of the product. But once we got above 15% of the ration in our research and in the research that was done in the Pacific Northwest, you typically see average day of the gain and feed con conversion efficiency uh, get poorer. And so we're simply making that recommendation based off of animal performance. What you probably have to take into account in your own operations is, is kind of what that product is costing you relative to corn or whatever other concentrate you're replacing with it. And so I know there's, there's a lot of folks that are feeding quite a bit more than that, but based on the biology of the animal, that's what our, our recommendation is, simply based on performance. And so once we got about 15%, we saw intakes drop and feed conversion efficiency go down. You know, we don't know that for sure. That that would probably be a, a component of that. Um, you know, it, it also has a little different fermentation pattern than, than our feed grains do, and so, you know, there's probably some things going on with ruminal fermentation that are also a player in that as well. Uh, the question is, if, if we're feeding cows, can we feed a higher level than 15%? Um, we we haven't tested that in forage, you know, if you're thinking about it as kind of a forage supplement or more of a cull cow feeding. You know, we we did our work with some finishing heifers. Um, most of the other work that's been done in the Pacific Northwest has been with finishing steers. You know, the, the biology of the, the cow, like a white fat cow sort of feeding program, uh, probably isn't a whole lot different than what you'd see with uh, with a feedlot steer, but but again, we didn't test it that way, so I don't know if I can give you a clear answer on what would actually happen. But there's folks here in the audience that got a lot of experience feeding cows, and I know they feed a lot more of it than what our recommendation has historically been. We'll talk. I'll show you a few pictures this afternoon of, of some of the storage methods and feeding methods I've I've observed over the years with that byproduct and. Um, you know, there, there are definitely ways you can feed more of it, but again, my, my recommendation is simply based off of the research we conducted here. Do you see using the byproduct, combination of byproducts, complement each other versus, we just did a study with Carl Hoppe over several nine years ago, his feet, and one of them we did for all of the bears. The, the question is, are there some complementary effects of combining some of these byproducts uh, with other byproducts uh, in improving animal performance? And, and in the research that's been conducted, in, you know, I'm going to speak in generalities here because each one of those combinations is probably a little different topic to talk about. But uh, in, in the, the typical combinations that you see where you, you might have uh, 10, 15, percent of the diet is wheat mids and maybe 10 to 15 percent of the diet is soy hulls or something like that. Generally you get some complementarity between products like that because generally speaking, you know, a single byproduct is going to have some nutrient limitations. It might be some sort of amino acid deficiency. It might be uh, something else that's kind of missing in that, that that doesn't really make it suitable for a complete feed. And so when you combine it with something else, whether it's another byproduct or you're using it as a component in a fishing diet, you, you typically see better performance with combinations uh, than you would with a single byproduct up to the, the typical limit. You know, you, you probably can't feed 100% byproduct diet and, and expect to get the same performance as you would with a, a diet that would be conventional, you know, corn silage, corn, and supplement type diet. But, but you know, if, again, speaking in some general terms relative to some of the research I've observed over the years, uh, when you look at diets that, that might be, you know, let's say we're going to say that we're going to feed 30% of our diets going to be byproduct based. Typically speaking, 
you're, you probably will get a little bit better performance better in that performance scenario that. if you're using a combination of wheat mids and soybean hulls, for instance, like with, with the backgrounding okay. calves, than you would if you went with all of one or the other of those products. And again, again uh, there is some complementarity. Uh, complementarity. With, with the ethanol byproducts, with the distiller's grains, uh, not a yeah, lot of research lot out there that's tested that, 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 but you're dealing with a little different animal there because, generally speaking, you're getting better performance getting better. on replacing corn in, in those diets with wet okay. distillers than you would be uh, if you didn't have the byproduct in there. So trying to find a way to complement that to get even better performance is pretty difficult.